if everyone online can see the uh, few that we have here, the 20 that we have in the building this morning, but they're nice up and close, ready to worship. Uh, this morning we have Elliot and Mia Bonza from Sounds of Soaring, not Sounds of Snoring. Uh, we, we covered this, I think, on the You Asked For It segment. It's amazing. It's amazing how words... How deep we go in meditation. <laughs> <laughs> you definitely know Sounds of Snoring, but together they form this wonderful ministry of worship and uh, I know if you caught the you asked for it segment last week with Elliot uh, sorry two weeks ago with Elliot you might have sensed his heart for worship and uh, we covered a songwriting segment and now our team out of that has started to put together some ideas for songs and uh, one of the gentlemen on our worship team Andrew he started uh, drafting a song prior to our discussion but we, we ended up workshopping at Elliot as a team called uh, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord and so We'll get to see that very, very soon in our venue, which is great. And, uh, and it's just sort of something that we want to do here is just write songs that are meaningful to the Lord and, uh, and meaningful to our community as well. And so, um, guys, I'd love it today if you would just press in to worship with Elliot and Mia as they worship the King. I know these guys um, uh, have produced some wonderful worship. And if you're on Spotify or Apple... Uh, music you can find you can get access to Elliot and Mia's album and uh, I'll get them at the end of the service just to relay what it's called and some of the songs and we're going to hear a couple of those this morning as well and so uh, and so today be blessed our worship team is blessed to have a week off but wherever you are just worship the king he's worthy of our adoration and of our praise all right God bless you thank you guys glory give you all the praise cause you lift our burdens and our heads you raise you're the glory and the lifter of my head You're the glory and the lifter of my head Sing that out Cause you're the glory to enter into worship I just want to share that I had a dream the last night the Lord gave me and it was pretty much I was in this building I've never been here before but last night I was there in the spirit and I just sensed the Lord was saying that I'm releasing a new level of childlike faith and dare I say playfulness in my presence in the dream I yelled out one thing that and forgive me if this comes across wrong, but I just hope it has some fruit attached to it. <laughs> but God has the biggest freaking playground in the whole universe. And He wants to restore childlike play to your faith. Where there is no fear, there's no fear of failure. There's no concern about being punished. But it's the communion that we have been given in Christ to enter into the Father's arms where he throws us up and catches us every time. So Father, right now, I'm just saying, lift every burden, break every yoke. It's your anointing. It's your anointing that breaks every yoke. You break every yoke. You lift every burden. And Father, I just thank you that you're lifting off the yoke of trauma from COVID-19. You're breaking it off your church so that the church can shine bright. 
unrestricted and unrestrained by the world or by religion, free in the fellowship of Jesus. Let our praise be a welcome. Let our song be a sign. We are here for you. We are here for you. Let your breath come from heaven and fill our hearts with your life. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you. To you our hearts are open. Nothing is hidden. You are our one desire. You alone are holy, only you are worthy, God, to fire fall down. Let our shout be your anthem, your renown, fill the sky, we are here for you, we are here for you. Let your word, let your word move in power. Let what's dead come alive. We are here for you. We are here for you. To you. To you. Yes. 
blood is enough for the nations to be reconciled to you open up our eyes we have come to see the Lord see his holy face to live in his sacred grace open up the gates with thanksgiving Entering his courts, fill with fervent praise, cause you are here all around us, Lamb of God. burdens fall away now we're light enough to mount up and fly in grace worldly robes of flattery are burning up as we spread our wings in this eternal
Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Just while I was worshipping here this morning, I had a, a beautiful picture of a, a deep brazen gold type bowl. And it was all adorned with beautiful diamonds and gems. And I just saw this incense arising. And um, I was just looking through the Bible. And there's so much about, you know, incense, our worship and our praise rising. And in Exodus 30, it says, And the Lord said to Moses, Take the sweet spices and only an oncha and galbanum. Excuse my understanding of the words and pure frankincense with these sweet spices there shall be equal amounts of each you shall make of these an incense a compound according to the art of the perfumer salted pure and holy and you shall beat some of it very fine and put some of it before the testimony in the tabernacle of meeting well i will meet with you it shall be most holy to you but as for the incense which you shall make you shall not make any for yourselves according to the composition it shall be to you holy for the Lord. It's holy for the Lord. Our praise, our worship here today, it's holy for the Lord. If I can encourage you to enter into this place, this holy sacrifice for the Lord. It's not for any other gods. It's for our Father God, our Father God who just so loves us so much. You at home. Do the same. Enter into that place. And sometimes it can be hard to do that. But he wants to, he wants to meet you there. He wants to meet you there. He, wa- he wants your praise. He wants your worship. He is holy. We bring you a pure offering. We bring Thanks. 
Listen to 
Mold me with your hand. 
Mold me with your hand. Mold me with your hand. Mold me with your hand. I'm playing the potter's hand. Mold me with your hand. Mold me with your hand. Mold me with your hand. I'm playing the potter's hand. Mold me with your Which is, um, which is awesome. So I love that. But uh, look, I just want to go through a few of the notices and things like that, that of what is happening this week. Uh, and the first I just want to draw your attention to, or actually, yeah, the first I want to draw your attention to is the foundation course that we are going to be running, which is called Hayasod, but that literally means foundations. So Hayasod is what it is called in the Hebrew language, but it's actually called Foundations in English. So we try and keep it simplified <laughs> so people don't get confused, but it's really exciting also to be learning some of these Hebrew words and understanding the real meaning behind it and why why they, why the Jews used to say it, the Israelites used to say it. Uh, so, so yeah, so Foundations. So a little bit about Foundations. We have one spot available left. This will be actually starting... Um, probably a couple of weeks after we actually start to get back together, which is around the 12th of July. And it's simply a, um, a discipleship uh, course on the Word of God. And so I've done it. I loved it. I'm doing it again. And because there is so much meaty information in there 
that um, you, I believe we all need to know. And as it says, it's foundational in our faith. And this is something that I encourage you to do. One spot left. So please, if you're wanting to do it, uh, speak to Kyle or speak to Teresa and they will pop your name down. Uh, I believe it's something that they're going to be continuing because we just want everyone in our church and uh, beyond to be able to understand uh, the full understanding of what the word says. All right, um, podcasts. Uh, just so you are aware, we are actually, all our recordings, that is on a Sunday, on a Wednesday, and on a Saturday morning. So that is Torah portions on um, Saturday morning. Wednesday night, it's slightly changed. I'm going to go through that in a minute, as in the name of it. And uh, Sunday services are actually going to be um, all on podcasts, and that you can uh, you can get on Spotify and on Apple. So simply type in the word Kingdom, Kingdom Church, sorry, and you will find it there. It's I don't know. I think I said it last week. For me, I love going walking, and I walk every morning. And this is what I I jump on podcasts and I listen to the stuff, particularly because. The word that Kyle and Greg bring is meaty and there is so much in it and I was, we were just hanging out with Alan and Teresa last night going, oh my goodness, <laughs> we just have to keep going over and over again to, to, and you learn new stuff each time. So there's so much value in what has been um, brought across and brought into your lounge rooms, into your living rooms right now in the church, not quite yet at the moment until July the 12th, um, that it is worthwhile to re-listen to it again. Okay, kids, you can jump online now and uh, with Rod and start your children's church. So have a good morning. Uh, as of the 12th of July, when we are back together again, kids will be actually starting church uh, as of the start of service, like we do when we come in here. So they'll go straight upstairs and start their church, their own little church service, which will be awesome. I'd love to actually stick my head in there sometime and see what they're up to. I'm sure it'll be a bit of fun. Yeah, I might be recruited. Alrighty. Now, you asked for it, which is what we have been calling our Wednesday night midweek online chats, so to speak, is now being called Need to Know Basis. Basis, is that right? Need to know basis. Yes. And the reason for that is uh, we have actually answered a lot of the questions of you've asked for it and now we are changing a slightly different trajectory and moving into this other area, which is really exciting because there is so much we can talk about, right? About the kingdom of God and what he does and you know, so Kyle has uh, actually approached uh, this lady called Peter Jeffries, an awesome woman of God, who actually has a business in fashion and it's called Rock Olive. Now, I believe she's got about four retail outlets and she's been very successful in the running of these businesses, which means this is a huge feat to be at, and I know this because I, I've trained retail this whole side of stuff. So I, good on her, being able to step away from her business and being called, doing what God called her to do, which is in going into other businesses and ministering to them. So I don't know about you, but this is something that I know I'd be really interested in listening to, um, just, just as a woman of God going after what she's been called to do, which is awesome. So please tune in. That's 7.30 on Wednesday night. If you need to know how to get there, jump on the Kingdom Church website and go through to, uh, well, you'll see the name Need to Know Basis. Scroll down and it'll click you through to Facebook and YouTube. Yes. Sorry, I get a bit confused because sometimes there's Zoom as well, but not for that one. All right. Okay. Torah portion. All right. Now, if you're not doing this, you're missing out is all I can say. And again, this is what we were talking about last night. And Torah portion, what is it? A lot of you may know already. For you that don't, jump online and do it. It's 10 o'clock on a Saturday morning. And Torah really means the first five books of the Bible. Again, we interchange with some words with um, Hebrew and English here, just so we understand where our roots come from, essentially. So Torah is meaning basically the first five books of the Bible. We also uh, cross-reference to other books of the Bible and, and also into the New Testament. And what you will find, which is beautiful, uh, when Greg, who brings the Torah portion, a lot of it is the foreshadowing of what is to come in the New Testament. And it is unbelievable. Like I said, I have to listen to it a couple of times. And can I challenge you, if you're not doing it, jump online. Now, Greg said the other day there's a 100 spaces on Zoom. Is that right? 
Now, we had more people last week. We had people from Sydney, Melbourne, we've got Brisbane, of course, Gold Coast online, which is excellent. Um, but please feel free to come in it. And what I love about it is the last hour as well. So you, there's so much media information in the first hour, but the last hour, I can tell you, particularly even well, every session, but because the last one is fresh in my mind, we talked about a whole heap of subjects that wasn't covered in the first hour. So it is worth your while to jump in onto the Zoom meeting if you only want to watch on Facebook, but come into the second hour at least. If you want to be there the whole time, yeah, we love it. It's just like hanging out with mates. And, you know, ask the questions that you want to ask. I also challenge you as well is to maybe prep yourself beforehand. There is so much content that is extracted from this uh, and the way to do that is actually to jump on Good News for Israel backslash Torah and Greg has actually provided this week's details. It has all the verses, it has everything there. Read it, it can be your Bible study for the week really and um, then when you get to listening to it with Greg and then again um, we cover some stuff on Sunday then you're fully prepped for it and, and to be honest there's so much so much you need to <laughs> you need that week to do it that's my my opinion and I think a few others would agree with me as well so yeah so this week we're going to be looking at numbers 19 but like I said if you jump onto uh, the website that I mentioned before it's week 39 that so that helps you all right so we're just going to move into a time of giving so there's two ways we can give. Obviously, one is through our website, which is kingdomchurch.com. Uh, dot, dot org, sorry. <laughs> dot org, apologies. And uh, go to online giving and you can follow the prompts there. Uh, and the other way is through direct giving, which is what I do. I set it and I, um, unless the Lord tells me to change it, I change it. Otherwise, it just goes through and I know the church is getting my money to help um, service people in need or whatever it might be build the kingdom but um, before I do that I just want to pray over it and I was just thinking in these last you know last bit of time there's some people that have been finding it challenging out there because they've either lost jobs or whatever it might be and and I was just thinking about that over my life and there's been times where there's been so much pressure with money uh, but you know as soon as I let go because I was getting stressed over being stressed if there's such a thing, but I'm sure we've all been there. And as soon as I let go of that and God came in, he said, he's Jehovah Jireh, he's our provider. We have no fear. We have everything we need in him, but it takes us to let go. And as soon as I let go, um, I, had, I felt like I had that freedom to just give more, not because he always came through, which is great, but because I wanted to. And which comes back to being cheerful about our giving, right? So let me pray for you today. And I just want to say thank you to everyone that has continued to give through this season. It has been challenging for some. But you know what? Bless you. Bless you guys for doing that. God's going to bless you abundantly. So Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much that you are Jehovah Jireh, our provider in every part of our life. And Lord, I just thank you that you are a big, big God. You know where we're at, where we're going, what we're doing. And I just thank you for the people in this church that give, that just love you and just want to give with a cheerful heart because they just love you and want you. And I just bless them in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, without further ado, we've got Carl coming this morning to bring the word. Thank you, Kelly. Well, good morning, everyone, uh, for the second time. And thank you to Elliot and Mia for uh, leading us in that time of worship. One thing I just wanted to um, note before we go too much further is I, I highlighted Elliot uh, a little bit earlier from our discussion, but I didn't highlight Mia. And I just thought I'd love to tell you a little bit about Mia. I know you're, you're there at the back, Mia. They've got a couple of kids. I'd love, I'd love you to stick around and meet those in the room. Uh, stick around and meet the kids, meet the family. But Mia is a prophetic voice into the community as well, a gift on her life. And so, I don't know, maybe, maybe at the end um, we'll, we'll see what happens. But that would be something that you might, you might just, if you've got anything on your heart, Mia, I don't want to close that up. Or if you're sensing anything from the Lord, just because he... Uh, had the mic doesn't mean that you don't have to as well and so if there's something that you sense I'd love you to feel welcome to to bring that uh, we've had a great journey over the last little while uh, exploring in the Torah portion these different elements of scripture and so today what I'd like to do is I'd like to preach further along this Torah portion but I'd like to bring out a concept that we can explore and uh, the 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 name the title of my message today is called the Lord is our God 
the Lord is one. Now, for those of you, some, that might ring a bell. And for others of you, it might not. Cam, have you ever heard that statement, the Lord our God is one? Have you ever heard that before, Cam? The Lord our God is one? Have you ever, you've heard that? Did you ever pray that when you were younger? You might not have ever prayed it. Now, for most of us in the room, we're probably Gentiles or non-Jews. But if you were living in Israel or if you were a Jew, every day, possibly twice a day, you would be using the words, the Lord is our God or the Lord, yeah, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. Why? Why would you be saying a prayer and what like that and what does it mean? Well, this prayer is called the Shema. I used to read it as Shema. It's spelled S-H-E-M-A. And I used to read it as Shema until I started to learn that sometimes our English version of what we say is not exactly right. For example, many of you have heard of the Didache, the Didache. And uh, it's, a, it's a document of, of discipleship to Gentiles. I just thought it was called the Didache, you know, like the Texan, almost like a Texan. And as I realized, as you tell people about this thing called the Didache, so they start telling you about the Didache, when really it's what, Dad? Did okay, right? And so, so we develop these. When we look at like the, the Greek word is this and the Hebrew word is this, we develop sort of little subcultures around how words are meant to say, sound, and how we say them. And so today I'm going to read from the Shema. No, no, the Shema. And so it starts like this, and it comes from Deuteronomy 6 verses 4. And, by the way, this is how you would have done it. Uh, where do we get the idea that we close our eyes when we pray? It was, it was probably most likely from the Shema. They put their hand over their eyes right hand over their eyes and then they would say this prayer i'm not going to go through the whole prayer because there are a number of blessings that get read out in this prayer but it says this "Hear, O israel the lord our god the lord is one blessed is his name his glorious kingdom is forever and ever so the shema places then a, an emphasis so if you were to read it out those blessings an emphasis on the covenant of abraham and then further to, to, uh, places a, a, an emphasis on the commands of the Lord. I want you to picture that if when you wake up in the morning, you were to say a prayer that was like, Thank you, Lord, that you are our God. You're the one true God. And today I thank you that you've grafted us into the covenant of Abraham. And I thank you that you've given us your commands. Now, in the Christian Gentile world, imagine if we then added to that, and thank you, Lord, that we're not under the law anymore so that your commands are less significant than they ever were. Thank you, Jesus. That would almost seem a little bit interesting considering you had just used the word, the Lord our God is one. And I want to explore what this oneness is. And the reason I want to do that is because we use words like God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. But I want to challenge you. Do you really believe that God is the same yesterday, today and forever? Because when you say, is he the same yesterday, today and forever? Do you add a but clause there that suggests that he's not? God is the same yesterday, today and forever, but he cancelled the law. God is the same yesterday, today and forever, but the tabernacle doesn't apply anymore. God is the same yesterday, today and forever. And you can say the Levitical priesthood is cancelled. Do you, with your language around the God being the same yesterday, today, and forever, find an excuse to make him not? Now, that might require a little bit of explanation, and that's what I'm hoping to cover today. For people watching online thinking, man, he's lost the plot. We're going to explore this. What does one mean? Well, when we look at the word one, one is an integer. One is a whole. One is complete. To be one, it's all-encompassing. But the best way I can look at it is the word integer. It's where we derive the word integrity. Have you ever noticed someone who has a lack of integrity? You may have talked to someone and you know that their word is not worth very much. Or you've met someone who has an incredible amount of integrity and you know that their word is valuable. That is because integrity, which comes from the word integer, which relates to one or wholeness, means you cannot detract from that person's character. Their word, their actions are complete within themselves. I know this to be true because I had a good father, dad, Pastor Greg Cumming, who taught us that if you say something, you mean it and you deliver on it. That is integrity. Integrity is very linked with trust. Trust is easily broken. Why? Because trust is comprised from your integrity. You, have, you don't have part integrity or some integrity. You either have integrity or you have no integrity. 
And so when we're talking about the Lord, our God is one, we're talking about his character. You cannot add to it. You cannot multiply it. You cannot add an exponential to it. But you also cannot subtract from it. You cannot detract from it. You cannot do anything with it which minimizes the character of God. Why? Because our God is one. You would look through the many translations of the word one and you would find that it also means alone. Our God alone. Or our God, the highest priority. In Hebrews 13, 8, to reiterate, our God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That is a reiteration that our God is one. Our God is one. But I want to challenge you that I don't actually think that most of us, probably in the Christian Gentile world, actually believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And how? We can test it. You might say, so what? So what if God's, well, if we say it, but well, I believe it says a lot about our faith. If we say something, but we don't mean it in our heart. You might be saying this morning, Kyle, where are you going with this? Well, allow me to explain. We're going to read together a story from number 16 this morning. And we're going to get to this point about God being one. By the way, with one, one can also have multiple. For example, we're humankind with two genders. And anyone else that wants to tell me there's more than two genders, you are wrong. I've got the mic <laughs> and, and biology seems to agree with me. So that helps. But there, there's something else as well, because there's not just male and female in terms of gender. There's 15 main ethnic groups. So in humankind being one, there's not only two, but there's also 15. In the triune part of God being one, there is a father and a son and a Holy Spirit who are not bicarbon copies of each other. They have different attributes, different purposes, different roles, and yet our God is one. When we get married, we're called as being one together, husband and wife. Are they the same? Are they carbon copies? No, they're these different roles in one. So if God is one, what have we detracted away from him? Let's look at number 16 verses 1, if you'll read with me. Now Korach, the son of Izhar, the son of Kohath, the son of Levi, Dathan, and Abiram, the son of Eliab, and On, the son of Pelet, sons of Reuben, took courage. We've got a group of guys that have decided to do something. They've banded together. And they rose up in front of Moses with, cert with certain of the children of Israel, 250 princes of the congregation, those called to assembly men of renown. So these men who have influence, banded together. They gathered 250 people to come before Moses. And they gathered themselves together against Moses and Aaron and said to them, you take too much upon yourselves. Sounds nice. Let us help lighten the load. You take too much upon yourselves, seeing the entire great congregation is holy, every one of us, and the Lord is among us. Why do you lift up yourselves above the congregation of the Lord? And when Moses heard it, he fell on his face and he spoke with Korach and he said the whole company saying, tomorrow the Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near. Even him who he has chosen, he will cause to come near. And then we see in the furthering of that scripture that, that God instructs Moses to give some instructions about a few tests. But what's really happening here? Well, for those that have done the Torah portion yesterday, you'll get, you'll, you already have a bit of insight into this. That a man named Korach, who's the cousin of Moses, is leading a rebellion of sorts with a couple of very influential figures against Moses. And his point is, we know, Moses, that you have been received into this role, but you are using your influence to appoint people who are close to you. And so we think we should all have that place. We should all have that role. And we look further, uh, well, really the main root of this issue was envy. Because if you look at Korach, he was already a Levite. Now, for those of you who don't know what the roles were, there was the priesthood or the Kohenites, which was Aaron, his sons and family line, and Moses was leading them as appointed by the Lord. Then there were the Levites who had a specific responsibility to follow after the tabernacle. And they were given specific roles, just as you and I are given roles. Some, some of you this morning arrived and those at home, you, you all have a role. Uh, Cam was overseeing our venue. His role was probably like the, the, the you were probably like Cora without the attitude, Cam. 
He was just vacuuming, that's right. But important role nonetheless. And Alan was there making sure that he and Teresa arrived at church on time. And, and, uh, and, you know, and all of us, Andrew, William and, and Josh and Wendy are making sure every one of us had a role. But what Korak said was, I want to be like Peter Lidicote. I want Peter Lidicote's role. He was saying, I want Moses' role. Why can't we, why isn't it that we, if we're all holy, can have that role? And so they formed a rebellion. The issue here is jealousy and envy. And it's a feeling of discontentment that is connected to someone else's possessions, qualities, calling, position, or accomplishments. And Korach had issues with Moses, the priesthood, the Levites. But can I tell you who he had a problem with most? And although he would never admit it, he had a problem with God. When you have a problem with God's appointments, you have a problem with God. When you have a problem with God's calling and what he's asking you to do, you have a problem with God. When you have a problem of serving in your local church and you decide you don't want to do something anymore and God hasn't called you out of it, you have a problem with God. When you're every day following what you normally do but wishing you were somewhere else and God hasn't allowed it, you have a problem with God. I hope you're you're picking up what I'm putting down today. (laughs) Korach had a problem with God. Why does he have a problem? Well, in a society of 600,000 people, men, and possibly millions, millions of Jews, he he thought to himself, "Should, should the Levites not be able to carry out the same functions? And the classic line is used, and I want us to look at it in our own lives today, of anyone who's got children, you will know this one. It's not fair. Ellie, have they used that on you yet? Yeah. It's not fair. And I remember I said it's not fair once to dad. I, I think it was the only time I said it's not fair. Maybe I'm wrong, but at least on this instance, it's the one I remember. It's not fair, dad. Dad looked at me and said, son, life's not fair. <laughs> Nothing is fair. And I remember thinking, well, that's pretty hard. Thanks, dad. But it's true. If you, if, who decided that you were born in Australia? Who decided that you weren't, Cam and I were talking about this the other day, who decided that you weren't working 14 hours a day to, build, to, to put together textiles and clothings and that was what you would do for the rest of your life? Who decided that you wouldn't be born in East or Western Africa and be succumbed to the treacheries of the environment? Life is not fair. But it doesn't mean that because you've been subscripted to that kind of life, that that's all that God has got for you. And so Korach was was, was totally discontented with what God had called him to, the role that was great. And we we realize out of this story that there's an incredible need for something. What's the incredible need? Well, out of all of the Levites, out of the high priests... Out of the people of Israel, there were only a select few people that God would allow come close to him and all of the other people would benefit. And that was the high priest. See, the scriptures and what God ordains is that there is a need for an intercessor or there is a need for a mediator. And that mediator comes on behalf of the people. And so that mediator was the high priest. And through the high priest, we could get close as a nation to God. Isn't this a wonderful picture of what Jesus did? It says, Jesus intercedes for us continually. He is the high priest and the mediator for your souls. So the need for a mediator in God's oneness has never disappeared. It was there from the beginning that there would be a mediator and that mediator's name is Jesus. So let's look at the three tests. Rather than argue with the people, and I love how Moses did this, by the way, because he could have done anything. He really, he he could have organized his leadership to go and flog these guys. He could have done anything, but he has had history with Korach, with uh, Davan and Abiram. Where's the history? Well, these guys, Davan and Abiram, according to tradition, are the same guys who continually spoke out against Moses. You remember the story in Exodus of where where Moses kills an Egyptian... uh, uh, man who's overseeing the Israelites, Davin and Abraham report him. And so it's his own brothers who report him to Pharaoh. When the burning bush experience happens and Moses comes in knowing, I have a call from God. It's Davin and Abraham who say, put put doubt on that. 
When they're out in the wilderness, and the first, by the way, there's two instances of when there was ma- a complaint for manna. When they were there and the manna was driving, dr- uh, they, they were complaining about the manna. Who was it leading the charge? Devan and Abiram. There's something to be said about a complaining spirit, friends. You, if you, you will know if you have it, and we will know if you have it. <laughs> because the complaining spirit doesn't seem to go away. It's there, and it's there, and it's there. And I want to encourage somebody now, if you've left a church and all you do is complain about your previous minister, you have that complaining spirit. The spirit that was on Devan and Abiram, that is the complaining spirit. And I want to encourage you. What we're going to learn from this is speak about people with honor. I want to tell you, wherever you're at, whatever church you're at, whatever fault you have, fault you have. Thanks, thanks, Pastor. Thanks for outlining that. Whatever fault you may have with someone else, what does the Scripture say? Speak ill of no man. I could very turn this easily today into a message about how you should honor me. That's, that would be a very prideful thing to do. But I don't want to do this. I don't believe that's what this text is about today. As I explore this Scripture here, I want to encourage you that there is a spirit of Korach And I'm not, please don't hear me today. I'm not making this like a spirit of Jezebel or a spirit of that. What I'm saying is there is something that can be identified in his nature that we need to be wary of. And so Moses, instead of casting them down, he took three tests. And the three tests were tests from God that God would have to deal with. The first was an incense test where they would all bring their their incense or offering to the Lord. And the Lord would choose whom he wanted whose he would accept and the Lord very swiftly and very quickly dealt with Korach, Davan and Abraham what did he say well to to paraphrase in the scripture he said Moses tell the people around the camp of Davan and Abraham and of around the tent of Korah to depart and what happened was that God opened up the ground beneath them And they were swallowed into the ground. It says to Sheol. And I know you discussed it if you're on the Torah portion yesterday. They were swallowed up into this hole. An act of God. What happened then? Well, it says that there was was also uh, a complaint from the Israelites. Moses, you've killed these men. Moses, you've killed these men. If I was Moses, I'd be, 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 you know, smacking my head going, well, hang on. Uh, did Did you see the sinkhole? Did you, did you witness that? I didn't, like, make that happen. <laughs> you know? And besides, my, it's Aaron's stuff that's powerful. No, I just... And so we have these three tests. And the final test was the staff test, where, where after God had dealt with, with Korach, after God had dealt with uh, Davan and Abraham, after God had dealt with the 250 by sending fire and consuming them, and the people still complained, he, they brought the 12 staffs from the tribes of Israel and put, put Aaron's staff in the center. And the rabbis talk about this because it was in the tabernacle. They say they didn't put Aaron's staff near the edge of, of the 12. So if you've got the staffs lined up one in a row, he didn't put it as the first or the 12th. They put it in the very center. Why? Because they didn't want an excuse for Aaron's staff to do anything special because of its proximity to God in the tabernacle. How's that? How's that? So standing up close to the front of the stage will not make you more holy, right? But it will, it will allow you to experience worship in a wonderful way. When your heart is towards God and you want to be close to Him, you want to worship Him, you want the best you can get for Him, but just because you stand close, it will not make you more holy. And just as Aaron's staff was not at the edge, closer to the presence of the Lord, it was right in the center. A miracle happened and it budded almonds. I often wondered whether they would be continually budding almonds. I mean, how good would that be? For, for Aaron, you're walking along and you pluck, that's nuts. Yeah, pluck an almond from there. That'd be great. Thank you, Lord. Although the scriptures would have changed slightly. It said God provided manna and almonds or, you know, manna, quail and almonds. But it didn't. It budded. And so God's sign in responding to the people was there. But we learn something here is that God chose and it was his oneness that it was the integrity of God that said, no, you will not make yourself leaders where I have chosen leaders. 
You will not become yourselves high priests where I have ordained high priests. You will not make rules for yourselves where I have already outlined the rules. This is important because when God says something, he doesn't take away from it. So God in his oneness established what the order of the priesthood should look like. I think that's exciting for us because that is a role that you and I should never have to try and take. Ah, I want to be the high priest. Mm, Don't do it. (laughs) Unless you have fireproof pants (laughs) and a a bouncy, you know, coat. It's even then. It's not going to work. It just will not work. And Devan and Abiram were also said, those guys, those two sneaky guys, I'll just imagine them for a moment, those Reubenites, Devan and Abiram, they, they were known to be troublemakers at Mount Sinai. This is according to, to tradition, by the way. God seems to deal with them only until they seem to attack his rule and reign, his governance and his statutes. It seems that he lets them go and he lets them go and then he lets them go and he lets them go and then he judges I think that should be a warning for us today is that if we have a complaining spirit of envy or jealousy, he lets us go, he'll let us go, he'll let us go. But at some point, that jealous or envious spirit will touch what God has set in place and he will have to judge it. And that's not a place we want to be, friends. So let's have a look at Jesus. Mark eleven twenty-seven to 30. It says this, And they came again, to Jerusalem. This is of Jesus. And as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and they said to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you, I will ask one question and you will answer me. And I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. Now, isn't that interesting when you answer a question with a question, but then with authority? I, I'm going to start trying that sometimes. When, when you ask me a question next, I'll, I'll, re- I'll respond with a question. I'll say, answer me. <laughs> Just see how it goes. <laughs> Forgive me. You've w- had warning in advance and I'll do it in fun. Answer me. I'm pretty sure he didn't do it like that. You know, Jesus' character is not as as harsh as we sometimes read it. Like, woe to you, Pharisees. I I, I think Pharisees, I think it's more like like a plea. Like, woe to you, Pharisees. You're missing something here. And Jesus saying, answer me, is probably more like, could you answer me that? Rather than answer me. And so we see here that they did the very same thing to Jesus. They questioned his oneness with God. What had he proclaimed? He proclaimed, I am Jesus, the Messiah. I'm one with the Father. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. That's the oneness. But what happened is they challenged his authority. And and we know that incredible judgments take place when you challenge the oneness of God. What happened after Jesus? Well, we have, after the time of Jesus, we have this wonderful thing that started earlier than the third century, but by the third century, it was well-defined. And it is called replacement theology. And those sitting in the room, it is not foreign to you that I've spoken on this topic before. But the replacement theology suggests that the order of the priesthood of Aaron has been dismissed. Now, I, I don't know, but that sounds like a lot of Koraks to me. And it's worth noting because if God judged Korach in the same in this manner, how will he judge the world? I'll tell you, if we jump forward to Revelation, let's just have a little look. And for those of you thinking this is a bit heavy, this part might be. But in Revelation, those that come against who? Can you say it to me? Who do they come against in Israel? I said the answer. Who do they come against at the end time? Andrew's got it. Israel. Right, and what is God's response after redemption opportunity, after redemption opportunity, after redemption opportunity? One verse in Revelation, a short verse that says, and God sends fire down from heaven and consumes them. Why? Why did he consume them? Because the same event that happened in Korach's time is happening now and has been happening for 2,000 years and will happen all up until the return of Jesus until we realize that God is one. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And to define replacement theology, it's the idea that the church has replaced Israel, that Christians have replaced Jews. And if we believe that with all of our heart, then we have missed that God is one. We do not believe that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
I'm telling you, this should be logical. If God is the same yesterday, today and forever, he cannot change his covenant. He cannot change his word. Are you hearing me this morning? He cannot. And so you can't have a Hebrews 13, 8 unless God is a schizophrenic God. And if God is a schizophrenic God, then the covenant that says we're grafted into it, why can't he change that? If God is a changing God and a double-minded God, why can't he change that there was a virgin birth? Why can't he change and decide not to wipe out the world and say, ah, Jesus, we're better off with those we already have? That's the consequence of saying that God can change his mind. But the problem is easily fixed by knowing that God does not change his mind. He is one. Now, for some of you, you may say, oh, but God did change his mind in that verse in number 16 where he wanted to wipe out the people, but he didn't because Moses prayed. I can tell you that your prayers have a great ability to petition wondrous miracles of God. Whether God was going to wipe out the people or not, God's heart for his people, God's, uh, Moses' heart for God's people struck a chord in the heart of God for not to wipe them out. But nonetheless, it was a mediator who repented on behalf of their sins for that action. And so it happened after Jesus. Deuteronomy 14.2, I want to establish what God's word and oneness is. For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Who's he talking about? Israel. He's definitely not talking about Ethiopia. And he's definitely not talking about Western Australia. For you are people holy to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you, Israel, to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of who? All the people who are on the face of the earth. Is there any question from Deuteronomy 14 that God is talking about Israel being a focused and favored nation? I don't think so. There's, there's not. Thank you, Dad. I, appreciate, I feel like when you say that, Dad, is, there's strength to it, you know. But furthermore, what does the New Testament say about it? You might say, and I know there are people who believe that the Old Testament has been done away with and the law has been done away with. I want to counter that with the New Testament. Let's look at Romans 11. Uh, Alan, you have been doing a great study in Romans 11. To Jews, let's look at what God says to Jews through Paul in Romans 11 verses 1. I ask then, has God rejected his people? Now that's a common thought by people today around the world, that God has rejected his people because of their, their uh, misbelief in Messiah and that so he replaced them with Gentiles and that the church is now responsible for what was referred to previously as Israel in the scriptures. That's wrong. I feel like I can matter-of-factishly say that. Uh, and if you would like to learn about that, I can help you. But to this, in Romans 11, he says, Has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. So according to Paul, in Paul's mind, Israel is not rejected. And yet we seem very good and adamant at saying that Paul has rejected or God has rejected the Israelites. But what does he say to the Gentiles? What does he say to you and me? In verse 17 of Romans 11, it says, but if some of the branches were broken off and you, although a wild olive shoot, I need to tell you that we are considered a wild olive shoot and Israel is considered the olive tree. If we were grafted among the others and now share in the nourishing root of the olive tree, do not be arrogant toward the branches. What's that saying? What has Christianity done over the last 2000 years? It has become arrogant towards the branches. Martin Luther, an incredible reformer of our Christian faith, anti-Semitic. Our Christian faith has been built on the lies of the arrogance of the branch. And we need to come back to realize that if God is one who does not change, who is the same God as the God of yesterday, today and forever, then that God needs to be known. His words need to be understood. And we need to recognize that Gentiles have not replaced Israel. And friends, I'm going to get to somewhere with this. I'm going to labor on it though because I, need, I feel I need to today that someone is trying to understand this message and I want to take you there. How do then do we confirm that? Well, in verse 29 of Romans 11, Alan will know this one. For the gifts and callings of God are irrevocable. Now, if God is the same yesterday, today and forever, 
but we don't actually believe that. He can change your call. Now, what is called traditionally in the scripture? A calling of God is whether you're really a Jew or a Gentile. They're the main times that you see a call of God used. When Paul talks about it in Galatians, when you read the call of God, it is about your identity that defines you in distinction as a Jew or a Gentile, different to gifts. But in your call, it's irrevocable. God is not going to ask a Jew to be a Gentile and a Gentile to be a Jew. I hope someone just breathed a sigh of relief then and realized, wow, God's not calling me to be Jewish. Or God's not calling me to be a Gentile if you're a Jew. And so the callings of God are irrevocable. Why? Because God is one. God's callings are irrevocable. Korak didn't like that Moses and Aaron which were his choices and history has done the exact same to God's people. The chosen people of God have a Korach kind of spirit for the last 2,000 years against them. Who are these people of God that God chose them and not us? Korach turned men of influence against God's chosen and blames the problems of God's chosen on him. We've done the exact same throughout our history. We've taken this word from God that he has chosen Israel and we've blamed the problems of killing Messiah, the problems of the world on Israel. We've seen it unfold in wonderful, terribly wonderful, wonderful, wonderful shouldn't be the word used there, in terrible ways. You look at the Holocaust. You look at many of our forefathers of the faith and they have persecuted Israel. They've become arrogant because they do not believe that God is the same yesterday, today and forever. I want to further that point. If it were not for the Jews who did accept Messiah, there would be no discipleship to the nations. Can you see how easily debunked the thought is, the lie, that the Jews had been rejected by God? If the Jews were rejected at the point of the cross, then what is the point of those Jews taking further discipleship to the nations? If God had done away with them, there would be no further point. Can you see how silly the argument is that God has replaced Israel? I I feel passionate about this this morning because we make God a liar in our speech. Through our lack of understanding and through our lack of understanding the scriptures, we present ideas where we cannot reconcile the scriptures. And so we say what seems popular, but we don't understand, friends. I'm not getting angry at you. I'm just passionate that I want to see you walk in a relationship with God and in the word of God. God is one. A challenge to God's chosen is not just a problem for us as people or for you as people, but has a more dire consequence. And that is that it is a problem with God. Replacement theology, if it is in your heart, is you having a problem with God. But here's the thing. Moses was a man of humility. Moses didn't go out of his way to try and prove them wrong. He left that with God. Israel as a nation is a nation of humility. They're not there out there trying to prove that they're the chosen people. They're acting very humbly at the moment, knowing that they are the people of God. I don't know if you've ever noticed when you've spoken to a Jewish person, you don't have to convince them that they're God's chosen. They, they will say that. I am I'm God's chosen. You know, that's what they say. You don't have to convince them of that. But they're not arrogant about it, lording it over the Gentiles that God has chosen us. And maybe there have been some, but I've not met one. And so Moses was a man of humility. Numbers 16 verses 9 to 10, I want to read this. And it says, And Moses said to Korah, we're going to paraphrase this in a moment. Hear now, you sons of Levi. This is Moses' rebuke. Is it too small a thing for you that God of Israel has separated you from the congregation of Israel to bring you near to himself? to do service in the tabernacle of the Lord and to stand before the congregation to minister and that he has brought you near to him and all of your brothers, the sons of Levi with you and you would still seek the priesthood. Can you see Moses' thought here? He's, He's saying, why? God's given you a wonderful role. Now I want to paraphrase this to the Gentiles for a moment. I want to paraphrase, paraphrase it. Imagine God saying to the nations, listen here. Adopted sons of Abraham. That's what we are. Is it mere trifle that God is, the God of Israel has separated you out from the pagans, the unbelievers, to bring you close to himself so that you can do work for the kingdom of God? 
and stand within the community serving so that you can minister to them. And now that you're near, you want the head role. That's why your group has gathered. Your problem's with God. Can you see in that paraphrase how the Western Christianity, Western Christianity at large, popular Christianity at large, has posed itself as a living embodiment of Korach. And we need to see a change so the judgment of Korach doesn't come upon the Gentiles who believe that they are in a wonderful relationship with God as the priesthood. It's pride. So what's our role? If it's not Korach, if it's not the priesthood, what's our role? Well, I need to talk to you a little bit about a thing called distinction theology, and I want to end here, okay? Distinction, distinction theology, Moses and Aaron recognized that they had different roles. Do you think they were confused? I don't think they were confused. Moses' role, Aaron's role. Korach had a confusion about roles. There was no confusion between Moses and Aaron, just as there's no confusion between me and Tash. I don't aim to ever try and bear a child. I, I, it's not something I want to ever try and do. Nor would most of the men here, probably all. <clears throat> but nor would a woman want to be a man necessarily. Now, I, I say that I know there are people around the world that are trying to cross those, those bridges. But let's just say for a moment that there is no desire for a person who is, is so wonderfully linked in that role of their manhood to want to be a woman. And there's no person who's secure in the fact that they're a woman who wants to be a man. Why? Because it's a God-given role. And I could go through role after role after role where we should be comfortable in the roles that God has given us. Now, if you're hearing me today and, I'm, and you're sounding like I'm saying women should be in the kitchen cooking and men should be, that's not what I'm saying. I'm talking about our biological makeup as man and woman and God has given us a role. But there is a distinction just as we are Gentiles, or most of us are Gentiles, and there are Jews. There is a distinction. And so there are also in the Torah roles that relate to kings and priests, men, women, rulings dedicated to them. And who's that all up to? That's up to God. God decides what the role is. God decides how it should look. God decides where it will end. God decides. Are you picking what I'm saying here today? God decides how we function. And there's room for us to envy. There's room for us to have jealousy. I will admit I had a little bit of envy this morning when I was hearing your beautiful angelic voice, Elliot. And there was, there was a sort of like a Korach spirit arose in me and thought, should I join him on the stage and, and waft in? Yeah. <laughs> But there's no room for envy in the roles that God has given us. We need to recognize the Korak spirit when it starts to arise because there's contentment in the role that God has given you now. If you're a student, you're a student committed to the role that God's given you now. If you're a business owner, you're a business owner committed to the role that God has given you now. If you're a man, for now, while you are on that earth, until God says there is no male and female, that is your role. See, God is important and he emphasizes roles. 1 Corinthians 7, 17 says this, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned or the role that has been assigned to him and which God has called him. This is my rule in all churches. That's Paul. Thank you, Paul. So you're defining now that there's a role of Jew and Gentile. Do not cross those barriers. Live as you are called. Oneness, though, is not the same as sameness. Um, one Messiah, one in Messiah is not the same in Messiah. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Jew, is being one does not mean we're an amalgamated new being. When the scriptures talk about one new man, it is not that we would be one completely new formed thing that is separate of our identity. God did not cancel your identity as a Gentile and he did not cancel your identity as a Jew. He calls you to be distinct and one, not same and one. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says this, For kin one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews, Greeks, or slaves, or free. All were made to drink of the one spirit. Notice that it says Jew, Greek, slaves, free. It defines roles. The body does not consist of one member, but many. The, those words will serve us well. But what is our distinction? Well, let's look at what the role of the Jews are, and let's look at what our roles as Gentiles are. 
The role of the Jews, according to Isaiah 42, 6, is this, to be a light to the nation. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and I will keep you. I will give you a, a covenant for the people, a light for the nations. The role of the Jewish people is a light for the nations. Apart from worshipping the Lord and all of the other roles that they have in the Torah, it is a light to the nations. Acts 13, 47, if you only read the New Testament, says, I have made you a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. The role of the Jews is to bring salvation, Messiah, to the ends of the earth, to bring the graftedness. I, I'm feeling excited about this because without the Jews, there are no Gentiles grafted into Messiah. But what's the role of the Gentiles? Well, according to Matthew 23, 39, it says, You will not see me until I say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So what unlocks Messiah returning to this earth? Well, you might look and you say, well, COVID, there's this and there's that. But I'll tell you what, there's one final thing that must happen across this earth. And that is when the Jews welcome Jesus saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is this song that Andrew and the worship team have been writing. It's, it's amazing. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. When we start to hear that from Israel, I tell you, I want you to look to the skies. Because if we haven't already missed it, we are going to see the hosts of heaven coming upon the skies. We're going to see the mighty Jesus, our King, coming upon the skies. But what is it that brings them to say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord? I'll tell you what it is. It's not Christians saying, hey, Jew Jewish brother, believe in Jesus and you'll be saved. You don't have to follow the Torah anymore. It will be Gentiles loving God and in their love for God, they will yield to him, accepting his rule and reign in their life, in our lives, in every manner of what that looks like. Torah observance? I don't know. Maybe. Definitely not ob obligated. But the Lord wants not just part of you. He wants some of you. And if we as Gentile... What did I say, Dad? He, he wants some of you. <laughs> Point lost. <laughs> I like that we can laugh about this. He, doesn't, he just wants a fraction. No, he doesn't want a fraction. He wants all of you. He wants all of us. If God is one, he wants one of you. Not half, not a third, not another kind of fraction. He wants one of you. And the God who's the same yesterday, today and forever says, hey, I'm going to come and live inside you. And if I can live inside of you and you yield to me with a whole integer of one, I will turn you into the image of my son, making you what? One with me. God's desire is that as he is one, you become one with him. I think this is the most fantastic thing that we believe sometimes as Christians that we can yield only part of our lives and yet we do not ever end up becoming one with him. One with him, I feel crazy eyes again. I've got crazy eyes because we, <laughs> I'm passionate about this. We need to become one with God. And how do we provoke the Jews to jealousy? It's through becoming one with him. You, we need to yield our lives. And when the Jews look across and see the Gentiles not trying to take the Bible or the New Testament and bash them with Jesus, oh, I tell you, what is harder? What is harder? Is it easier to say the love of Jesus or is it easier to sit with a Jew uh, and, and, and say, here is Messiah and here is how Jesus is Messiah? I probably only know a handful of people in this world who I think could actually have a conversation with Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> With Jews, we, we all should be having conversations with Jesus. I only know a handful of people who could probably prove that Jesus is the Messiah. But I think Gentiles, if that is our one thing that we are called to do and roll, that should be a priority for us. Can you prove that Jesus is the Messiah? Oh, brother, he loves you. Yeah, no, he does love you. But how can you prove to me that he's the Messiah? Are you going to tell me? Now, imagine that I'm a Jewish brother for a moment. As a Jew, are you going to tell me that your Jesus cancelled the Torah? Because if he cancelled the Torah, according to Deuteronomy, he's not the Messiah. That carries a consequence. You understand that? Can you tell me if you understood the qualifications of Messiah that we would use some of the anti-Semitic and breaking down language that would prove that God is not the same God? 
See, that's what our language does as Gentiles. It puts a barrier between us and they call us Christians as a joke. They do not want what we have. They are not jealous of what you and I have. When we, when we flaunt replacement theology, when we flaunt our words that say things, that mean stuff to us but aren't based on the Scriptures. Friends, our goal and our role is to provoke them to jealousy by understanding this thing so well, understanding our God so well that he, we become one with him and that when the Jew looks across at us, he says, they're serving and loving God better than I could and ever would. And I want that kind of relationship with my father for I am a chosen person. And if that is the Messiah and they're living according to the Messiah, then I want that Messiah. That's the message. The message we preach often is God has changed, Jewish brother. And now everything you believed in for history is no longer relevant. I speak not for other churches, but I hate it when I hear, let's preach a relevant message. The whole Bible is relevant. You cancel the Old Testament, you have made it irrelevant to a whole nation. You have made yourself irrelevant to a whole nation. This is worth studying. This is worth knowing. If I challenge you today and say God is the same as yesterday, today and forever, then there is a divide that we need to cross with our language. Rather than being like Korach and challenging it intentionally or unintentionally, we need to come to a place of repentance and say, Jesus, or Father, make me one with you. Make me one with you. By the way, how does God say to love him? How does God say to provoke the Jews? John 14, 15, it says, if you love me, can you repeat what I'm about to say next? Obey the commands. What commands would those be, Jesus? I believe that if... John 1.1 1, 1 is correct and it says, In the beginning was the Word or the Torah and the Torah was with God and the Torah was God. Then we have to do a reassessment of what the Torah is. Because if the living instructions for the people of Israel was the culture of God given so that they would find their role and purpose, then we too need to understand what our purpose is within that and not outside of it. And for whatever reason in history, we've chosen to ignore it because it's something we don't understand. But I believe this church is going to be looking and we're going to be looking as a community on what it is to know God. God's not changed. He's still the same today and forever. Yes, friends, there's no temple. And so only 369 of the Torah's commandments actually apply today for Jews. Well, that's a lot easier than 613. I'll start there. What am I saying? Am I saying that we need to know and obey all of those 369 commands? You okay, Rod? <laughs> he, oh, you're down here, Rod. <laughs> Kids' church went well then. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. Not the internet. And so we, we know that we're going on this journey to understand the commands of the Lord. What will remain when Jesus returns? I want to end on this. Matthew 5.17, the Torah will remain. What will remain when Jesus comes back to this earth? Now, for those who might say the Levitical priesthood has been cancelled, just want to tell you, you're wrong. Can't say it any simpler than that. Zondervan Publishing Company will have to stand before the Lord because, and so will the NIV and so will many of our translations where they have added to the Word of God and they have added things that are not said. Zondervan, for example, has added that the Levitical order has been cancelled. That is simply not true. Now, Jesus makes a statement. He says, not one yod or vav shall be removed until all is accomplished. Not one jot or tittle. How can a publishing company add to the scriptures? Constantine added into the scriptures the wonderful story that we get about the woman who was caught in the act of adultery. Now, that doesn't go against the character of God, but it was an addition that was not found in the original. 
Constantine added in things into the scriptures like baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. They're not necessarily contradictory, but they're stuff that we need to explore so that we know what was and what isn't. The priesthood will return. There will, according to Zechariah 8.23, and I'm going to read this, it says, This is what the Lord Almighty says, In those days, ten people from all languages. Is, who's that, by the way? That's Australia, that's England, that's America, that's any nation you can think of. In those days, they will hold firm one Jew of the hem, and they say, Let us go up with you, because we've heard that God is with you. Is the role of the Jew and the Gentile incomplete? No, it's not. Because it's the role of the Jew to take us with to the mountain of the Lord. So where to from here? Deuteronomy 6 verses 5 to 9. I want to read this to finish. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and all your might. Take heart these instructions which I charge you this day. Impress them upon your children. Recite them when you stay at home and when you are away. When you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them serve as a symbol on your forehead. Inscribe them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. This is where the Shema comes from, the prayer I mentioned at the start. When you put your hands over your eyes and you say, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, and you start to proclaim, why do they do that? They do that because the command of the Lord is, I charge you this day, recite them when you stay at home, when you're away, when you lie down, and when you get up. If anything, isn't that something that we could start to do? Start to pray the things that the Lord wants us to pray. Start to live the way the Lord wants us to live. Today, I want to invite you on a journey with us to not be like Korach, intentionally or unintentionally. My heart for you here is not to be judged by the Lord God Almighty, but to sit in the sweet spot of the oneness of the God who never changes. To not think that the church has replaced but rather to recognize the difference in roles and that if we can do our role well, we will see the return of Jesus. I'm going to pray. And uh, Mia and Elliot, could I invite you guys up to just worship with us one more time? Would that be okay? Father, I would ask today that there be repentance in this place, that there would be repentance in our congregation, our community and across the world. For where we have been like Korach and we have tried to replace or say, why not me? Where there has been jealous envy and strife in our hearts, I ask that you show us, Lord, how to repent. God, we want to be one with you. We want to abide in the vine. We need not want to be arrogant as the wild olive branch. And today I ask, Father, that you forgive us. In this moment of forgiveness, Lord, we ask also that you show us the way. Many of us don't know how. We don't know how to walk. We don't even know what's next. But Lord, I thank you that your light, your word, would light our way and that we would become one with you. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Well, family, if you're at home, maybe you stand up where you are and family in the church today, you can stand up as well. We're going to worship and then uh, after we worship, Kelly's going to come up, close the meeting and uh, enjoy some time together. If you're on Facebook or YouTube today, you've got any questions, I encourage you to write them down. Jeff and Leanne, the online pastors, will send them through. We'd love to answer them rather than have them sitting out there in the void. And so uh, God bless you. Thank you, Elliot. And thank you, Mia. Stood on a mountain
Wisconsin Waiting for you to pass by With your hand over his face In your presence so he wouldn't die All of Israel saw the glory And it shines down through the age Now you call me to boldly seek your face Moses stood on a mountain Waiting for you to pass by With your hand over his face So in your presence he wouldn't die All of Israel saw the glory And it shines down through the age Now you call me to boldly seek your face Show me your face Lord Show me your face And gird up my legs that I must stand in this holy place. Show me your face, Lord, your power and your grace. I can make it to the end if you show me your face. David knew there was so much more. Then an ark of your presence In a town the Messiah was born In a room full of peasants All of Israel saw the glory And it shines down Now you call us to boldly seek your face. Show me your face, Lord. Show. holy place show me your face Lord your power and your grace I can make it to the end Jesus show time. Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face, Lord. Show me your face. And gird up my legs that I might stand in this hole.
I can make it to the end. Jesus, show me your face. I can make it to the end. Jesus, show me by the Lord of some imagery. Um, I was in the car with my little girl, Taya and Samuel. And as we were driving, we saw this flock of birds in the sky. And I said, look, Taya, look at the flock of birds. And the birds were swaying to the left and to the right. And they were swaying in such a motion that they looked like a fish in the sky. And I'm like, oh my goodness, this looks like a Pixar film. It looks like, you know, on uh, Finding Nemo or something like that, where you saw um, the fish forming those bigger fish and forming those bigger pictures. And I'm like, this is like a Pixar film in the sky. These clocks of birds are forming. And we were like marvelling as we were driving. We're like, wow. Okay, skip a couple of days later and we're in the car with a whole family. And my eldest son, Elisha, turns and goes, Mummy, Mummy, look to the left. And I look to the left and there was a big flock of birds just all gathered together, the cockatoos, the white um, cockatoos with the yellow sprouts and masses of them gathering together, gathering seeds on the ground. And uh, the Lord spoke to me. He's he's like, ponder this, Mia, ponder this. What What do you know about this? What am I speaking to you about this? And I'm like, well, it's a flock, Lord. It's a flock of birds. And he goes, yes, I'm gathering my flock. I'm gathering my flock at this time, Lord. May I'm gathering my flock. I've been gathering my flock throughout the ages. And at the moment, in this time in history, all throughout the world, the flock has been scattered, hasn't it? Churches haven't been able to meet and the flock has been scattered. The birds have all been scattered. But the church is, is responding to the voice of the Lord. The church is, the, is His people. It's not us gathering in our our buildings and things, even though that is so important and this is so necessary to gather together. But I feel like the Lord wants to declare over you guys today and over the church. He's saying, I am gathering you and I want you to respond to my voice. Because who, who do these birds respond to? Who's the king bird that follows that flock to make them into little fishes in the sky or images in the sky? Who's, who's the king bird that they respond to? I don't know. But I know that we have to respond to the voice of the Lord. The voice of the Lord, as you are scattered in your houses, as you as you cannot gather together, as you may or may not listen to the whole of this word because you could be distracted to do something else. It doesn't matter. But you need to listen today to the voice of the Lord and follow Him because He is gathering people to His voice. And as we listen to His voice, we will gather like that flock and be a sign in the heavens to the nations that they will stand in wonder and they will say, look at that. Look at that people group. Look at what they are are forming. Look at what they are declaring over the earth. That as you respond personally to the voice of the Lord, we gather and we are like signs to the Lord over the earth. We are like signs and wonders in his hands. We, his people, are for his signs and wonders. So I want you to respond to what the Lord is telling you to do during your week. I want you to respond to when he tells you to go and to serve this person or to bless this person or pray this prayer. It is essential to respond to his voice because as you do so, we gather together and we become a sign and wonder to the nations. And they say, look, these people know the voice of the Lord, like Moses gathered on the mountain. You know, for years, ever since I was a little kid and even as my husband Elliot was a little kid, we'd marvel at Moses and how he'd go up to the mountain and talk face to face with the Lord. And for years, my prayer is, Lord, I want to talk to you face to face. I want to know you face to face. And as we can, we can and we do now, we talk 
talk with the Lord face to face, but are we going to respond to Him when we talk to Him face to face? So be blessed today and respond to the Lord and we will be a sign of wonder to the world. Thank you, Mia. That was beautiful. It's funny what you sang to the last song. Cam and I were just reading this week ourselves about how the Lord covered Moses' eyes and it was just like, what had happened when he covered his eyes? What was he seeing? You know, like, what was that process? So that was just beautiful. Thank you. Well, what a great morning. I've, I've loved this morning. And um, if you have any questions out there, particularly with what Kyle was saying, please reach out to us because there's stuff there that maybe people don't fully understand. Um, and if you haven't been on that journey, you may not. Uh, we're here to talk to you. So please contact us and we'd love to hear from you. Well, you have a great day. Um, bless you, whatever you do today with family, with friends. Rest this afternoon before you start going back to work tomorrow. And we look forward to catching you next week. See you later.